Hi guys and welcome to Better Data Science. Today we'll finally build somewhat of a usable image classifier with convolutional neural networks. Until this point we will only use vanilla artificial neural networks for classifying images. That's not the approach you want to go with as you're leaving a lot of performance improvements on the table. We'll start today's video with just a bit of theory behind convolution and pooling layers. The following video will dive much deeper into these subjects, so stay tuned to the channel. After the theoretical part, we'll go over the implementation and evaluations in TensorFlow, and we'll see the performance improvements we get. Before watching, you should have TensorFlow installed and dataset prepared. If that's not the case, simply click on the video you see on the top right corner to get you started. And without much ado, let's cover the theory. Convolutional neural networks are just a special type of uh, neural network used for image classification. At the heart of any convolutional neural network lies the convolution operation, which is an operation highly specialized at detecting patterns in images. Convolutional layers require you to specify the number of filters. Think of these as a number of pattern detectors. Early convolutional layers detect basic patterns such as edges, corners and so on. Special patterns are detected at later convolutional layers, such as dog's ears or cat's paws, depending on the dataset. A single filter is just a small, usually rectangular matrix. It's your job to decide on the number of rows and columns, but 3x3 three three or 5x5 five five are good starting points. Values inside the filter matrix are initialized randomly. The task of a neural network is then to learn the optimal values for the filter matrix given your specific dataset. Let's take a look at a convolutional operation in action. We have a 5x5 image on the left and 3x3 filter next to it. The filter slides or convolves over every 3x3 set of pixels in the image and calculates an element-wise multiplication. The multiplication results are then summed. The process is repeated for every set of 3 by 3 pixels. Here's the calculation for the following set. And then you basically repeat the process until you reach the final set of 3 by 3 pixels. From here you can flatten the result, pass it into another convolutional layer, or most commonly pass it through a pooling layer. The task of a pooling layer is to reduce the dimensionality of the result coming in from the convolutional layer by keeping what's relevant and discarding the rest. The process is simple. You define an n by n region and stride size. The n by n region represents a small matrix on which pooling is performed. The stride represents the number of pixels to the right or to the bottom the pooling operation moves after completing a single step. The most common type of pooling is max pooling, the most common region size is 2x2 two two, and the most common stride size is 2. This means we're looking at a small matrix of 2x2 two two pixels at a time and keeping the largest value only. Here's an example. You can see how we reduce the image size while keeping the pixel values that matter the most. You don't have to take the maximum value. Another common type of pooling is average pooling and it does what the name suggests. Max pooling is used more often, so we'll stick to it throughout the video. To summarize, max pooling reduces the number of parameters by keeping only the pixels with the highest values, which are most activated pixels, and it disregards everything else. You now know the basics behind these two operations, so let's implement them next. We'll start with a topic known as image data normalization. Before doing anything else, please make sure to delete the following two pictures, as they are corrupted and can't be used by a neural network. These are located in the following paths. So the first one is in data train cat number 666.jpg, and the second one is in data train dog 11702.jpg. I haven't found any corrupted images in the validation folder, so we should be good to go. And now let's get the library imports out of the way. We won't need much today. Mm. 
min logging level will set it to 2 now numpy tensorflow let's set the seed and for image visualization we'll need to peel to display images in in the notebook we'll need to import the display function and also we'll ignore all the warnings oh, we are missing stf here sorry about that and now let's load in a sample image and display it so data train let's say cat one jpeg and let's display the image let's also check the shape so first convert it to an umpire array and now check this sh this should be shape so the above cat image is 281 pixels tall 300 pixels wide and has three color channels Unfortunately, this doesn't apply to the other images in the dataset. Let's load in a random dog image and check its size. Train dog zero. Let's print the shape. The dog image is 375 pixels tall, 500 pixels wide and has three color channels. It's bigger than the first image and the neural network won't like that. It expects images or arrays of identical sizes. We can resize them as we feed data to the model, so that's not the issue. There's something more urgent we need to address. The pixel values in individual images range from 0 to 255. Yeah, as you can see from this, this is just a matrix representation of the image. Neural networks prefer a range between 0 and 1, and you can translate an image to that range by dividing each element with 255. We can actually do this step automatically with data loaders. Let's explore how next. You can use the image data loader class from TensorFlow to specify how the image data is generated. You can do a lot with it, but we'll focus only on rescaling today. So TF Keras preprocessing image image data generator and just apply the rescaling operation which is 1 over 255 and we can copy paste this for the validation data we don't care about the testing data as we'll handle it differently a bit later you can now use these image data generators to load image data from a directory you'll have to specify a couple of parameters and I'll explain what these mean as I write them so train data plus to train data gen you can now access the flow from directory and now the directory is just a path to where the images are stored so data train target size well that's the size to which all images will be resized to 224 by 224 works well with neural networks. Now class mode. We'll set it to categorical. 
as we have two distinct classes, you know, cats and dogs. Batch size, I'll set this to 64 and it represents the number of images shown to our neural network at once. And finally C, this is optional but I'll set it to 42 so you can get the same images as I did. There are 20,030 images in the training folder divided into two classes. The train data variable is basically a Python generator object, which means you can access a single batch of images without too much trouble. So just train data, next. Each batch contains images and labels. Let's check the shapes of these. So, so these are the images and now the labels. A single batch contains 64 images, each being 224 pixels wide and 224 pixels tall. And each image also has three color channels. There are 64 corresponding labels. Each is an array of two elements which is a probability of an image being a cat at index 0 and the probability of an image being a dog at index 1. Let's take this one step further by visualizing a single batch. You should always visualize your data. It's the best way to spot an issue with data loaders. Just keep in mind, the images were previously rescaled to a 0 to 1 range. To visualize them, you'll have to multiply the pixel values by 255 and convert the results to integers. Let's declare a function that will visualize our batch of 64 images. So visualize batch, it will accept a batch which is tf keras preprocessing image directory iterator will display in total 64 images with a number of rows and number of columns equal to 8 and 8 so we'll get an 8 by 8 grid we access plt subplots and we'll increase the figure size a bit And now we'll iterate over the range, multiply the image by 255, so it's batch 0 to get to this essentially, and then it image, multiply the array by 255 and specify the data type as unsigned integer 8 and now let's plot it Im show image We'll edit the layout slightly, tight layout, and PLT show. And now let's use the image. Batch equals to our first batch. So there it is. I'm a bit zoomed in, so that's why it looks weird. But there you have it. Some of these look a bit weird due to changes in the aspect ratio, but it shouldn't be an issue. All images are now 224 pixels tall and wide, as you can see from the markers on the X and Y axis. And that means we're ready to train the model, so let's finally do that next. First things first, let's reset our training data loader and add a loader for the validation set. Valid data is 
data valid and yeah everything else remains the same oh it's validation okay and we can declare the model now just keep in mind that training boils down to experimentation there's no way to know how many convolutional layers you'll need nor what's the ideal number of features and the kernel size we'll now write a model that has a single convolutional layer with 16 filters and 3 by 3 kernel size followed by a max pooling layer so model 1 is tf kera sequential So the first layer is a convolutional layer, so it's conv2d, we'll have 16 filters, kernel size of 3x3, three three. and in the first convolutional layer you'll have to specify the input shape. Which for a single image, which is uh, 224, 224 in three color channels, and also the activation function, which we'll set to ReLU. The convolutional layer is followed by the max pooling layer. So max pool 2D. We'll set the pool size to 2 by 2. We'll set padding to same. And now we can flatten the results generated by the max pooling layer. And from here you can add dense layers as you usually would. I'll add one intermediary layer so we don't get to the classes immediately. And now the output layer, which is also a dense layer. It will have two nodes and it will be activated by the softmax function. Keep in mind that you can't use uh, the sigmoid function since, since we have two distinct classes. Now let's compile the model. Loss is TF Keras losses categorical cross entropy this is not a binary cross entropy so we have that in mind optimizer uh, let's stick to Adam and matrix you know the classes are almost perfectly balanced so we'll stick to accuracy only Let's fit the model. His history one is model one that fit. Fit and training data. Use validation uh, data generator as the validation data. And train it for 10 epochs. This should be epochs. We got around 71% accuracy on the validation set, which is an improvement over a model that didn't use convolutional layers. We can still improve it. Let's see if doubling the number of filters makes any difference. I'll just copy paste the model code. So this is model 2, compile the model to his 2. Okay, and double the number of filters. That's the only change we'll do. Once again, I'll get back to you once the training finishes. The model looks like it's stuck around 70 something percent accuracy. Let's add another convolutional and pooling layer to the mix and see if we can improve it. So this is model 3. And 
and the second convolutional layer doesn't need the input shape. And that's it, let's drain it. And that does it. We got around 76% accuracy on the validation set. Feel free to experiment further on your own, but I'll stop training models here. The third model is good enough for now. Let's see how you can use it to make predictions. Please remember that you have to apply the same preprocessing operations to the test set. I forgot this step many times and it resulted in weird and uncertain predictions, you know, small difference between prediction probabilities. For that reason, we'll declare a function that resizes a given image to 224 by 224 pixels and rescales it to a 0 to 1 range. So prepare a single image, image path, and returns a numpy array. Image is image open from the image path. Image is image resize. And the size is 224 by 224. And then return the image as a numpy array divided by 255. We'll now use it on the single image from the test set. So data test cat 1018 JPEG. So here's how the single image looks like. It's just an array. It looks good, so let's try to predict it now. A single prediction was to model three predict single image and we need to reshape it it will be 224 to 24 by 3 and at the start you need to put minus 1 now let's see the single prediction so the model is almost 100% certain this is a cat image Index 0 is a cat and index 1 is a dog. You can use the argmax function to get the index where the value of an array is the highest. And that's it. That's how you predict a single image. Let's make predictions for an entire folder of images next. There are smarter ways to approach this, but the method I'll show you below is deliberately explicit. We'll iterate over the folder and make predictions for a single image and then keep track of how many images were classified correctly. First, let's set up the variables. So num total for cats and num correct for cats. Both are zero initially. And for the dogs, also zero. And now for image path in patlib path you can do this without patlib i'm just showing you an additional way this is in data test cat iterate over that directory and this could fail for some images so let's do the code here and if anything fails We'll just continue, we won't bother with it. Okay, so in the code, we first preprocess a single image. The path to that image is a string representation of the image path, since image path by default is a path lib object. So prediction is model 3.predict. And if you don't like using the resize or the reshape function from above, there's an alternative. You can use the expand dims from TensorFlow. Axis is zero. And a prediction is just the argmax, as we discussed. 
and will increase the total number of images predicted for the cats if the prediction is zero meaning index zero represents the cat we'll increment the number of correct cats and that's it we can copy the same logic for dogs this is dog num total dog and here if the prediction equals to one increase the number of correct dog classifications the cell execution finished we got a couple of warnings but it's nothing you should worry about num total cat so in total we made 1244 predictions for cats let's see how many did we get right this is now correct cat total cat this is actually the accuracy for the cat class it's around 70 percent so let's say it's good enough for today and for dogs So we're doing much better on the dog class. Overall we have a much more accurate model than when we were only using the dense layers. This is just the tip of the iceberg as we haven't explored data augmentation and transfer learning yet. And that's all I wanted to cover today. Let's finish out this video next. We've only scratched the surface with convolutional neural networks today. By now you should understand the basic theory and know how to train a convolutional model. There's still a lot more you can do. In the following video we'll dive much deeper into how convolutions and pooling work and we'll also see what applying a filter matrix actually does to an image. After that we'll dive into data augmentation and transfer learning as a go-to approaches for creating highly accurate models. In the meantime please consider giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing to Better Data Science. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.